We're talking to Ayana and Jada from Black Lives Matter in London today. How are you guys doing? Good. How are you? I'm yeah. awesome. It's Friday. Uh, are you guys ready for your protest tomorrow? Yeah, um, I think we're as ready as we can be. We're not really sure how many people are going to show up, but um, we're trying to be ready for anything, I guess. Yeah, I was just talking to Jada before um, we start recording. It has like become a life on its own. Like I'm seeing media everywhere about this. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, we didn't start it with the intention of it being this big. We never even thought we'd get any news coverage, anything like that. Um, I think we've just kind of been learning as we go along and trying to kind of, as it's had a life of its own, trying to control that and weave it into what we want. But um, yeah, it's been a learning experience, I'd say. So how did you guys get here? So um, I posted something on my Instagram yesterday about how Malcolm X, the autobiography of Malcolm X has really moved me. It has already always moved me. It's my favorite book of all time. I went through two copies. I had it since I was 13 years old. Um, what influenced you to be here today? Was there anything that you grew up on reading? Um, I looked a lot into black history when I was younger, like from a young age. I liked learning about Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and the, the civil rights movement, Rosa Parks, all of that. So I always knew that I wanted to do something about that because if they could fight for it, I could fight for it too. Yeah. So that's what influenced me. I think it was similar, um, a similar experience for me. I think I kind of grew up, um, in a very kind of gentrified place. So a lot of people were preaching, um, MLK and a lot of his, and they kind of took the parts that they picked out of MLK, and I think I got more interested when I started looking more into him, and I realized he wasn't this just picture-perfect person they tried to make him out to be, and then that's when I kind of got into more of a Malcolm X philosophy, and I kind of started to find a lot more people who were, it wasn't just cut and clean things like they fought for years, and I got really interested in that, and I knew that I wanted to be involved in that community somehow. Did that humanize him? Martin, when you found out that he was not the perfect being? Um, I think less so than humanize him. I think, um, uh, I don't want to get, like, a racial at all, but, like, I find a lot of people try to gentrify his, what he stood for and try to put it into this little box that they're okay with what he stood for. And I find when I started to look at him and look what he really stood for and that he wasn't always just somebody who the media loved. They hated him for years and it wasn't always like that. I think that's when it wasn't, honestly, he was better in my eyes. He mm -hmm. he became more human, but um, he became more of somebody that I felt like I could relate to. Yeah, because I'm just gonna add on to that because yeah. people think uh, they have to use Martin Luther King to justify being like, oh, you can't riot. And he's just, he preaches um, peacefulness, but I think that they don't realize that he also said, a riot is the language of the unheard. So they pick and choose what they want to uh, make him seem to be so they can prove a point. So that's just what I had to add on to that. <laughs> I think that's an important point, talking about Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. I think um, what I think was really interesting to me was that the media tried to, and a lot of people still today, try to pin them against each other, two strong black men fighting for something. And they try and say that just because they had opposing agendas, they were still fighting for the same thing, even though they hated both of them at times, that people often use MLK. But um, I think, although they may not have agreed on every point, it's ridiculous that people have painted this picture that they hated each other, when in reality, they hated what they were fighting against. And they, at the end of the day, they were fighting against the same thing. So I think that was a really important milestone as well for me. So, yeah, and you know what? Like, even today, even, even last week, I was when I was producing my last podcast about this, I was going to use a Malcolm X quote, but I'm still iffy about using it because even back when, you know, I'm not telling you my age, but when I was up to years ago, um, when I was like 10, Malcolm was the bad guy, Martin was the good guy. And I think people still think of him, oh no, Malcolm was cool, but later on in life when he left, you know, the Black Panthers and everything. And then he found out. So it was, it was still like, you know, 
So it's easier to back Mel uh, Martin when Malcolm was still like that kind of guy, that kind of shady. Like, oh, you like Malcolm? He was racist, you know. Yeah, I think um, that was a very important point too. Um, the racist thing. I think a lot of people like to paint Malcolm as racist, and um, the way I see it, you can't be racist to white people if they created the system. Um, so I think that's a very important thing. People like to say that he was racist, but I think that he was just very honest in what he wanted. And you can go two ways of things. Um, MLK wanted peace and he wanted equality and so did Malcolm but Malcolm was a little bit pissed he was more angry and he had every right to be and I think um, that was a really great example of how black people are only allowed to be angry about things in a certain way for it to be accepted if you are mad about it as you should be they paint you as some sort of unreasonable character but um, yeah yeah I think um, people want us to be complacent in our anger and I think that's very frustrating and I don't think a lot of people see that because they just want to kind of keep the peace when that peace is riddled with oppression it's not really peace for everybody <coughs> oh pardon me that came out of nowhere um so yeah that is this coming out now after so many years we didn't really have we haven't really seen this since I heard somewhere that the last time there was a big art riot like this was Rodney King. Um, is the anger coming out now? I think anger is coming out now because it's been too long since we have, we've been fighting peacefully and people tend to get violent after they have, they've been speaking peacefully and nothing has been changing. So even though people are rioting. I think there's a good reason for that because that's how they they get hurt. That's why the, the people who killed George Floyd got arrested. It's because people spoke up upon it. And if no one did that in the first place, I'm sure they would have still be walking free because if we stayed silent, if that video wasn't um, leaked and people didn't see how he got killed, um, they would have still been at their jobs and this would have not been looked into. So we do need to raise awareness for this stuff because that's the only way we get justice. So, I think oh, sorry, go on. Uh, just to add on to that, the anger thing, um, I think it's also a mix of things because you see a lot of, obviously there's a lot of Antifa people, which I'm not going to include, but I think it's not even just black people who are angry at this point. Everybody's angry at um, a system that not only oppresses black people, but is really just meant for the 1%. It is just meant to better them. And I think with COVID, with everybody losing their jobs at, and employ unemployment rates at an all-time high, people are only on certain checks for months to feed their families and I think that all those tensions are starting to raise and things aren't getting better and they're just kind of drilling into the ground. Canada's in debt, the US is in debt, everything is kind of at tensions are high, people are angry and people are starting to realize that they're the majority, that poor people are the majority and they can't change things, they have their voice and they might not have a lot but at this point um, they've kind of backed them in a corner where, what do we have to lose? As Trump said, what do we have to lose? And um, I think that's honestly a really great point. Like, we don't have anything to lose at this point, and we're ready to stop being, uh, yeah, just generally oppressed. It's, we're sick of being complacent, I guess. I was talking to my dad. He lives in Florida, and he was kind of making it as a joke, but it actually, when you think of it, it was serious. He said, well, no one is working. So everyone's at home. They'll go home rest up and then come back out tomorrow afternoon because they, they have nothing to do um now uh where were you guys when you first heard about this when you watched the video and what were your reactions were um, you can go first. okay um i believe i watched the video um it was my birthday the day before and the 25th and that was my sister's birthday so it was i think it was pretty late and i saw it on twitter and um, I think everybody can agree, especially in the black community, it is, um, it's really hard to talk about it and really hard to, especially it's harder to watch it. And when that video came out, and I'm glad that it got plastered everywhere because a lot of people tend to be under the mindset they don't believe it unless they see it with their own eyes. And I'm happy about that, but it's, I'm happy that it got spread. So people started believing it, but having to log on to every single social media platform and seeing that video over and over and over and over again, really, I, I haven't seen the whole video. Um, I don't want to. Me too, yeah. Yeah, it's too hard to watch it. And I think that a lot of people forget that it's traumatizing and it's hard to watch it and it's heartbreaking and it 
it kind of takes a piece out of you. It's mentally exhausting to log on to media, even right now, seeing um, seeing other black people die and you see that it's for no reason. And it's it's like there's something you can do about it, which they are doing about it. But in that moment, you know that they were powerless against the system that has been working against them for hundreds of years. And it just it takes something out of you, I think. And yeah, I just I guess it was despair and just just exhaustion from seeing it everywhere was my reaction. Um, when I saw it, I was off social media for a couple of days, so my mom showed me it, actually, and I, I couldn't watch it. I told her to turn it off because it was sickening, saying that he was begging for his life, but the police officer continued to put his um, knee on his neck, so it was really traumatizing seeing that for me, especially because I have black brothers, and I'm like, that could have been my brother, or that could have been, like, my dad or my relative, and yeah, as Ayana said, it's... It's a really terrible video, but I am also glad that it has been spread around social media because that's how we raise awareness to things. Because people do not believe racism exists and oppression exists unless they see it on the media or on social media or whatever. But yeah. Do you think it was going to get big as big as it is? Um, I think pretty pretty soon into it. I think I knew that it was going to this was gonna spark something because I think people were sick. It happened like back to back to back, Brianna Taylor, Arbery, and then this one came out and there was clear videos on two out of three of them. And the Brianna Taylor one, people weren't being arrested. People weren't being arrested with the Arbery case until two months after, until it went viral. Things weren't happening and people were starting to realize they need to speak up. They need to be angry. They need to be rioting to get noticed, to be taken seriously, because other than that, we're just going to be brushed under the rug. And if you go on social media, even now, as I mentioned, you can, you just scroll through a timeline and you see black child, black woman, black man after black person after black person just getting murdered and nobody's doing anything about it. And until we put the work in and we get petitions signed and we start rioting, we protest and we get their names heard. So I think it started, people started to realize their power with the George Floyd case because they spread it around and people started caring, people started getting involved that weren't involved before. And I think that was when people kind of became empowered again. Like the last time we saw it was maybe Trayvon Martin levels. Yeah. So. so it has become a life of its own, has, especially on Tuesday with the blackout. What I've been still been reading and I don't know why it's 2020 I mean to tell you the truth it's 2020 we shouldn't be talking about any of this right now in 2020 I'm, I'm repeating that year just because people realize it's 2020 <laughs> it's not 1968 <laughs> or 1960 I just think it's so ridiculous anyway I'm not going into my spiel about that um what is your thoughts when you're still seeing people saying all lives matter uh i mean if you want me to go on that one um infuriating um i'm definitely um i think it's disrespectful and it's personally disrespectful um if you do that i take that as a personal attack because you're telling me that in the face of me begging for um black people to be seen as people to matter to you're telling me oh all lives matter and i think that one of the there's two reasons why I hate it. I think it's a protest um, to our protest, and that's just that's ridiculous in and of itself. And it's it's infuriating to see people just wipe our struggles away and be like, oh well, somebody told me I don't season my food, so we're oppressed too. And it's like they don't even bother to educate themselves on our struggles, on the things that we go through, on the pain that we went through as a race and individually as well. And I think the second point is that. Oftentimes when people say all lives matter, you can very quickly debunk it by just talking to them for a few seconds because they're not often for all lives matter. They're only for their lives mattering. They're only for white lives mattering. They don't care about stuck in cages. They don't care about people in poverty. They don't care about orphanages. They don't care about homeless kids. They don't care about any of that. They just wanted to be known that, hey, no, we matter too, but nobody ever said they didn't. We just wanted to be included in that mattering. But at this point, all lives can't matter until black lives do. So I think that needs to be completely addressed. So when people do say that, I, I get angry. And because at yeah. this point, so much information on the internet that if you're ignorant, you are willingly ignorant. 
and not to like generify a group of people but usually people who do say all lives matter are racist because i've seen a couple people being like um uh, black lives don't matter all lives matter so it's like are black lives not considered lives to them like when they say all lives matter what are they putting in that all lives um i usually make a little metaphor people who don't understand what black lives matter stands for and i'm like okay well if there's like five kids and one of them gets hurt who do you help all five of them are the ones that is getting hurt. Like if you give a bandage to the one that's bleeding are all like all five of them. And they're always like, oh, but that's not compared to that. But it's like, you have to think about it in that aspect because even though it's way more serious than that, it's just, you have to like simplify it for some people to understand why we say black lives matter and not all lives matter. It's because black lives are not seen as they do matter in society. To add on to what you just said, I think um, I, I kind of hate that that um, euphemism that people use, not that we don't have to use it because we definitely have to simplify it down for a lot of people, but I think it's infuriating that there's grown men and women out there and people old enough to know when I've understood racism from the age of six because I've had to, I'm sure Jada's had to, but at this point we are almost, we're 18 and people are still needing to simplify it down as, oh, Timmy got a little cut on his hand so you need to help Timmy when you should just understand that black lives matter. You should just understand that. We shouldn't have to simplify it this movement for you if you're not getting it you're not trying to and I think that's a really frustrating part because it's like we have to fight for you to understand and then on top of that we have to fight for your change and it's just really frustrating we never convince them to understand like it's really like when you try to like prove a point to someone they will never agree with you so it's really just like a waste of time in a way yeah yeah and how about in Canada so um we know all this is existing in the states how is racism right now in Canada? Okay, I'll just say something first. In the States, racism in Canada and the States are the same, but in the States, it's more um, focused on in the media. Like, we're better at hiding it, but there are people who are getting killed by police in Canada. There are people who are facing racism discrimination in Canada. Um, same with Indigenous women that go missing and Black people who go missing that aren't looked into. Uh, but in the States, I feel like it's more open that racism does exist there. But since people are like, oh, it doesn't exist because I don't see it, you know? That's why people believe that Canada is, like, this peaceful place where everyone's equal when that's not the case, just because, like, they don't see it on the media. I think, um, to add on to that, I think the reason we see um, a lot more overt racism in the United States um, versus here are for two reasons. I think this overall have a very um, violent philosophy in the core of who they are. I find people grow up very confrontational, people grow up very in your face, and I don't think they hide a lot of things, so I think that they don't hide racism here. We almost take after Britain, where it's like, "Mm, we don't talk about it. We don't talk about those things, because um, a lot of our culture is from there, and I think, um, secondly, the United States has a lot more black people, so there's a lot more of a voice. They are a lot more heard here. We are not, the, they're the mini- minority there, but here we're even less so, especially with indigenous people and black people even combined. Like, there's not enough of us that people are listening to. The majority is still white, and we don't have a voice against that, especially when even if indigenous people would talk um, or use their voice, a lot of them reside on the reserves, so people don't take their voices seriously. They just, oh, they're over there now. They don't really count in our community, but, um, It definitely is very existing here and I think a focal point of it is systematic. It is not so much as um, overt. I mean it is overt but um, I've had people come up to me all the time which is a point that I want to touch on not to get off topic but um, I used to work at McDonald's and I think people didn't really realize there that when I was working even as light-skinned as I am people would just call me the hard ER all the time if I messed up their order if I did anything like that like I would get it all the time and people were so shocked to see that they're like I didn't know we had racism here and or we'd have skinheads like uh I don't know like you know proud boys kkk types um, come in all the time and just be very like aggressive and things like that towards me and people were just so shocked because they didn't know that racism existed like that but It does. It is very overt here, but it's also very systematic and kind of pushed under the rug. It's like, that's the way things are. Uh, So I grew up in Toronto. I came to London in 2017. Now, coming from Toronto to London, huge difference. I mean, I was part of the hip-hop community in Toronto. I did shows. So I was, you know, I I was part of the culture. So now coming here, I found a difference. What do you think of London specifically? Is it too conservative? Um, To go on that, I think that London is very conservative. Um, I think that 
as well as, like I said before, kind of a Canada-wide issue, there are not enough Black people or just POC in general. Toronto is very much a hub for that, a lot of different cultures there. So I think there's almost, there might be more clashes, but there is a lot of different communities. So they kind of blend together. But here, and I know here specifically, we have very deep KKK roots. Yeah. And things like that where we are one of the most racist cities, but I think Canada-wide people are genuinely, or generally, more conservative and less progressive because they don't have to be because things are the same things stay the same i remember um, driving up to my grandparents house we would go by cities and even up north i don't know sault Ste. marie mm -hmm. i went to school there for a few years and we were me and my brother were the only black kids in our school and people would always um it's little things like they would always pull my hair um because they didn't think it was real or they would say things like go back to your own country or anything like just it started there it started at young and we were only like six years old and i was getting those wow. things grow up it gets worse and because just to add on to that um when i was younger in grade four this is kind of like off topic but um in grade four i was one of the only black people at my school and once my teacher was like go to the back of the line because you're black and I, like at that young age i was like why would I, why do i have to go to the back of the line because i'm black so I told my mom and that got like a huge issue. We got like a black people association to get her fired and stuff. But it's like racism exists even at schools and even your teachers are, could be racist to you. It's not just students or like your peers or people on the street. It's like people that have like control over you like in a way like um, could be racist to you. And then it's like, where do I go to now that my teacher is the one being racist? And like, who do I tell, you know? How does she justify that? I don't really remember, but I remember the last day before school, she was like, why would you say that? And I was like, I don't know, like, you said that to me, but I don't really know because I wasn't uh, involved in it because I was young, but my mom kind of handled that. So I don't remember that much, but I do remember that vivid moment, be like, go back to the line because you're black. But I think she did deny it at the, the beginning and tried to deny it, but I think another black kid in our school had um, an issue with her too. So it's like, okay, my main point here is that teachers can be racist and that's swept under the rug also so people are like racism doesn't exist and i'm like no you you can't tell me racism doesn't exist if you don't experience racism yourself if you don't yeah. experience it you can't tell me it doesn't exist yeah and is yeah. that where the white privilege is coming in right now oh absolutely um i think white privilege is um i think people get it twisted a lot so i'll just go brush on that at the start um People often get it twisted. They think white privilege means that you've had a great life, that you've had all these opportunities for you. And it is not always like that. We understand that there are a lot of white people impoverished right now, but it's that your life has never been made hard because of the color of your skin. You have never been denied jobs. I, you've never had to change your name. I've used my other name instead of, I use Ayana Cole instead of Ayana and Zayamana because oftentimes when people see that, it might reflect badly and they might not even look at my resume or when I'm talking to people, I have to simplify myself and my culture and who I am to fit into their gentrified box and I don't want to always do that but it's like it's things that they don't like I said before yeah. or Jada also knows this um, we've known about racism from young ages because we were never taught it we experienced it and that's how we learned but I think white privilege is learning it it is educating yourself and I think that you're taking way too much advantage of that when people are just like oh they don't understand. They're too young. When I've known about it from six years old, to have me 16 is too young to know about these things. So I think that... And you are taught racism. You're not born racist. So you can't be like, oh, they're too young. It's like, no, your parents influenced you to be racist. So being like, oh, they were too young is not an excuse for racism because that just reflects badly on who raised you and how you were raised. Culture you were raised in. I think that's a... There's a very racist culture in Canada that people don't tend to address because it's um it's almost like passive aggressive racism like um i guess a good example is an experience i had at work with my manager um me and this girl came um up from work and we were wearing the exact same thing we were like we had our shirt tucked in the exact same way and my manager looked at me and said that i looked ghetto and i was like oh but she doesn't and she had no issue with the other girl's uniform but she always kind of went after me and said that i look ghetto i look cheap things like that and was always 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 going after me and I think that it was it's things like that where I told other people that and they were like well maybe she just doesn't like you how do you know it's a racist thing I'm like no but you know you do you know when it's racist and you know if when you have to change your personality and the way you talk on the phone because like using your white voice that is just like white privilege because on the phone I have to be like oh hello like hi whatever and like my name is literally 
pronounced like Raida, but because no one can pronounce that, I have to simplify that for people. And that's just, I don't know. I just don't think my mom and my parents immigrated here for me to fit someone's like tongue and how to say it. But I used to get bullied because of my name because it used to be pronounced Gaida. People would be like, oh, haha, you're gay, duh. Like, this is really yeah. off topic. But I think um, you, us having to change our identities and having to change our personalities just to fit in, that is just, that is racism in itself. Like, that is just not equality because white people never have to do that. They never have to use the white voice because they are white. Because they, like, you know, um, this is also very off topic. But uh, people always like to be like, oh, there's higher um, crime rates in black community. It's really because black people get arrested for everything. Like, of course, there's going to be higher crime rates. You get pulled over because you're black. And it's like you run a red light, but you still get arrested and detained. But with, if it's a white person, they just get off, get off with the warning. Um, yeah, sorry, I just went off there. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, wants to be uh, black on black crime. We hear that everywhere. It's always, oh, well, we're not going to fix the police brutality issue because there's black on black crime. And I think that people fail to understand that the police brutality issue, that is a systematic issue based on race. We never hear about white on white crime, Asian on Asian crime, because it has nothing to do with their race. If a black person kills another black person, it has nothing to do with their race. It is not racially motivated. It is there two people killing two people. And I do think that's obviously wrong, but you don't get to negate- A black it. person doesn't kill another black person because they're black, as opposed exactly. to- Exactly. Never yeah. happened. Negate the issue of race in your system, embedded in that system, and say, oh, well, you guys are killing each other anyway, so what does it matter? Um, I think that's absolutely ridiculous, and that seems to be an argument used countless times, and I, I just want to touch on that because I hate it. Is there anything that Canada or London can learn from what's happening in the States? Is there anything that they're doing maybe that we can do? Is there something that uh, we can take from this as a as a country, maybe something if like if Justin was with us right now with his hair and his beard and everything, um, what would you tell him what you're learning now from the States to tell him, hey, look at this? Um, I don't know about Jada, but personally, I don't like Justin Trudeau. I didn't like him before I found it. He did blackface. Don't like him after. <laughs> um, not a fan, but I guess that would be where I'd start. Um, I think what I would definitely start with would be also um, addressing those issues, paying attention to people who are bringing up issues like this. When your country is protesting, it is clearly not something you need to push under the rug. If that many people are coming together because they see a common issue, you don't get to just say, oh, well, you know, they're going to complain about things. Yeah. And we shouldn't have to protest for pe police to get arrested for killing people. We shouldn't have to ask for that. That should be a given. Like, yeah, that's just all I have to say. Because there's not much to learn from the states right now because, like, Donald Trump isn't doing anything, too. So it's like we can't teach Justin Trudeau something to do that Donald Trump isn't doing. Um, Donald Trump is uh, telling people, the police officers to shoot people. So he publicly murder. And I think also the fact that, just to brush on it, um, I don't think, I think we can learn from everything that he's doing not to do here because yeah. he is. They are committing war crimes there, but they're not considered war crimes because they're not in a state of war. They're doing things that are legal, but who's going to hold them accountable? So it's like, um, I think that what we can learn from here is that although all that's happening and they are committing those crimes as a country, look at how it's tearing them apart. Look at, is anything getting better? Because they won't listen. So if you just listen to your people, if you listen to the people who are bringing up these issues, I think it'll run a lot more cohesively, at least entertain the conversation and don't write us off. I think that's a very- Donald Trump did not um, bring up the murder of George Floyd. All he said was, these thugs are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd or whatever. And it's like, someone gets killed in your country, you're running this, but you don't even acknowledge it or pay his, your respects to him. So I really think uh, Donald Trump, this thing happened because he did not care in the first place. That's why people protested and that's why people are rioting because he did not care in the first place. So it's like, okay, how are we going to make our voices heard? Like, he knows about this issue, but he's not doing anything about it. So we have to take matters in our own hands. Even, I think, adding on to that, um, the fact that he called people who are fighting for justice thugs, but people who are protesting, I, I called it before even all of this started. I said to, I was like, I just want to bring attention to um, the fact that white people can go protest with assault rifles in police officers' faces over a virus 
but black people are unarmed. They are peaceful. They are just fighting for a cause that they believe in. Somebody dying, somebody's losing their life against a system that continues to allow them to lose their lives without any justice. And, oh, sorry, somebody called me. Um, it's okay. But I think that that was another tipping point because it's like, you clearly see there's bias. You can't tell me that there's not racism just woven into all the systems in your president and everything. So, and especially to go from Obama, although he committed a lot of crimes too, um, to go from Obama to Trump really, I think has been, this has been in the making. This, these riots, this um, protest, this outrage has been in the making for a few years now. And I think this is just the, this was just tipping the iceberg. And I think, yeah. And you now people are talking about mental health. My podcast are, is about mental health, my, both of them. Um, and people were talking about mental health issues with staying at home and COVID. Is mental health, is racism a mental health issue? And if it is, is it being addressed more? Or no. should be? No. I'm just going to go really quick and say no. I think that calling it a mental health issue gives them a right, gives them another yeah. excuse. They don't have to know any better. I think that's, they cause mental health issues. I know I grew up, and I'm sure a lot of people grew up with being bullied about things like that. And um, I think to give them that out, we often victimize white people. Right. And I'm a controlled mindset. Like, if, like, let's compare it to depression. Depression is an unbalanced chemical in your brain. With racism, you control being racist. You have to educate yourself. It's a choice for you to be racist. So saying yeah. it's a mental health it does give them an excuse to be like, oh, I'm just mentally ill. Yeah, and we seem to, I'm not saying that white people are the only people that can be racist, because obviously POC can be racist towards each other, but I think that often when it comes to white people, we often victimize them. A lot of the time, you'll see um, a black person do something, and obviously they're a thug. They're protesting peacefully, and they're thugs, but when a white guy goes and shoots up a school and kills innocent people, innocent children, he is just a troubled young man, yeah. and we often age black people and make them more responsible than they are and they are children Trayvon Martin was a kid he wasn't some grown man that looked intimidating he was a child and it's things like that that really um get me angry like, because we, yeah, like black people. Emma Rice was shot and killed by police because he thought that the police officer thought he had a gun like he was threatened by a 12 year old because he had a gun and that was justified it was like oh he was threatened by him but let's say uh he got killed for playing in his backyard but a white person can go shoot up many people. He's peacefully arrested. He's just taken to jail. I'm like, oh, sorry, he's troubled. For food, like Burger King. They took him for Burger King to yeah. humanize that when they humanize them, but they dehumanize the whole. It's like they just don't see us as people anymore. They see us as a problem. And I think that's what really needs to be addressed because they don't hear it. They don't want to hear it. They don't, they don't want to change because they're comfortable in their racism they're complacent in what they're doing and um i think this is bringing about the change that's been needed for a long time but yeah i don't think it's a mental illness to bring it back to that point i think that just gives them another way out to make excuses for their ignorance and is is, is it um sorry i'm just getting really mad about this um <laughs> uh so if it was if it's not a mental health issue, I'm not saying it is, if it's not a mental health issue, um, and, you know, like, how, what are we, what are we doing? I mean, on Instagram and everything, on social media, people are posting readings and books that we can try to educate yourself, or ourselves, even us, about everything that's going on. Um, is there anything that goes deeper that we could, they could do? I think, um, the first step, I guess it's a hard jump for a lot of people. I know reading up on a lot of things is a hard jump for people, but the first step and the most important one is acknowledging your privilege, acknowledging that you get to learn about this, acknowledging that you've waited this long to learn about it, but now you can make a change. Acknowledge all the things that you can your do. Because you do yeah. have a louder voice than people of color. Like if you're white, you do have that privilege. And if you fight for something, you might uh, get it more easily than people of color or black people. Absolutely, or be heard because we're often um i know probably jada has been put into this boxes before but whenever black girls seem to talk about things it's we're putting to this box of an angry black girl and we're yep. just written 
way. We can't be mad about things. We can't be angry about issues because we're just some other angry black girl bitter about another thing. But it's like, we do face most of the discrimination. I know I definitely benefit from colorism and that is definitely an issue in our own community, but just that stereotype in and of itself that, oh, they're just angry black girls. And it's like, we have a lot to be angry about. <laughs> like using the excuse, oh, but you're light skinned. It's like, no, but if you are mixed, usually you tend to look more black unless you are like more white. Um, but they're like, oh, but you're like half black and half white. It's like, if you do look like you're black, if you look like a minority, you are a minority. You don't look at someone like, oh, they're mixed. Let's um, consider them white. You, you uh, media consider them black because they have black in them. So I feel like that's also a stupid thing people say. They're like, oh, but you're mixed. Oh, you're light skin. It's like, no, they still face discrimination. I, I think it's less because like colorism in our own community, but we are still treated equally as black people as a whole. That's a funny point, not to get off track, but I think that's a funny point that um, Jada brings up because I do bring it up a lot. Um, the fact that white is the default and if you're anything else you're tainted and i think that stems from the one drop rule but if you're anything else you are always if you're mixed with if you're half asian you're always going to be asian you are always going to be looked at as asian i would i'm still very light-skinned but a, nobody ever sees me as white if i said i was white people would be like but what else and if i said i was black people would just stop there and it's like there's always there's it's like okay you can't just be white because Clearly you're something else. Clearly you're mixed with something else. But if I say I'm black and they're okay with me identifying as that because they accept that as a whole, but you can't be white if you're mixed with anything else because that's no longer white. It's like, it's the, like I said, the blueprint, the default. And it, I think that's also a racist standard um, that we should address, but that's just another list of the issues. I get that with um, being Muslim. So mm -hmm. whenever I say, oh, I'm Muslim, people are like, oh, no, you're not. You're too cool to be Muslim. Or you're one of my, one of my, my white friends said that I'm the cool Muslim. Um, okay, listen to this. Listen to this. Okay. Um, I am also Muslim, and I got in, in an argument with someone lately because I was talking about racism in the Muslim community. So I was talking about it to him. He's like, but you're not even black. You just have the same color of skin. You are considered Arab. You're considered Muslim. I'm like, no, I'm still, as a race, I am black. Religion and race are not, you know, they're not the same thing. Yeah. People often do that because uh, I was speaking about um, racism in the Muslim community and the Arab community as a whole because black people are often discriminated against even in our own communities. So I was talking about that and he got mad about it. He's like, you're not even black. You don't go through the same experiences as they do and whatnot. But that I'm just saying, religion <laughs> and race are not interchangeable. I think, I think that the that. thing that you said, um, that people would kind of coin you as the, um, the cool Muslim or things like that, or you're the cool black kid. Um, I used to try and fit into that. Um, I used to try and be the token, token black friend because I was surrounded by majority white people and I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to fit in and it took me a long, long, long time to get out of that stereotype, to escape from that and remember that I'm confident in my own blackness and I don't have to change for anybody else. I don't have to gentrify who I am or simplify who I am and hide my blackness to be accepted by or other people. people of other people yeah yeah I, I find that a lot of black kids do that and a lot of people struggle with their whole lives um wanting to fit into the society because the society is run by white people so there's always that urge to like if i just whitewashed myself then they would accept me or they might and they never really do but you're always coined as that token friend because if they tell you like if they're telling you oh um you're cool for being a muslim kid then they're ignoring that part of you. They're ignoring that you're proud of that. They're ignoring that bit of you and they're chipping part of you away. So they don't really like you. They just like parts of you. That they stereotypes because they're like, you're the cool Muslim kid. So what is a not cool Muslim kid? What defines a, a cool black person or a cool Muslim person versus the not yeah. cool one? It's like what they see oh. in the media. Um, are Muslim people like all terrorists? Is that like what they mean? I don't understand. What, I want to, yeah. But I find a lot, um, it's like, Whenever you're a minority community, you are one dimensional. I find people look at them as one dimensional. You can't be other things. And I think like I brushed on before, I struggle with that because I like kind of the alternative scene. I like those things. And I do like a lot of um, like, you know, the rap culture, things like that. I do like that, but I also liked the alternative scene. I was always told that's white stuff. You can't do that. That's white people stuff. And then people would always look at me weird. And now I've learned to embrace both parts. I can, know that I'm confident in my blackness and not be one dimensional. I don't have to fit the stereotypes that they're pushing onto me. And often those stereotypes aren't even true at their core. 
but um, growing up around a lot of white people, you, you're influenced by that. You grow up thinking that, and it's so hard to escape from that, and so hard to escape from the tokenism that they put you in. Yeah, I grew up in the grunge era, so me being brown, mind you, I was a lot of into hip hop back in the day, but grunge changed everything for me. And uh, yeah, it was kind of weird because I was brown. But there was one time, uh, the day of 911, um, in the afternoon, my friends and I decided to get together at Eastside Mario's and just go to the bar and watch it on TV, everything unfold. 90% of my friends back then were white. And I lived in Richmond Hill, Ontario, very white town. And um, my dad called me, he was living in Michigan. And I said, yeah, I'm going to Eastside Mario's, meeting up with Simon and everyone have some beer and talk about this. And he said, back then I had a big beard and long hair. He said, cut your hair before you go out, cut your hair and shave your, shave your head. Cut, sorry, cut your hair and shave your beard because people are not looking at you as Shane from Richmond Hill. They're looking at you as a brown kid, Islamic brown kid. Which I don't understand, okay? Because white people, when they shoot up schools, they're not all looked at as school shooters. Exactly. But a black a crime like oh they're criminal or uh muslims oh they're terrorists or extremists it's just like why are we painted as one part of our community when white people have been doing things but they're all seen as different in a way brings yeah. in that one as one person has to represent all of it and i think that even things like um my friends like they have prayer alarms so when those go off in public i see that people give them stares and people give them looks and you don't even understand it to hate it you just, you just, gentr uh, you, sorry, not, you generalize all of that as something that you hate. And for what? Like, I, I think that's so infuriating because of the same people that say, oh, it's not fair to assume that all white men are school shooters. I'm like, but you're doing but the same. All cops are bad, but I'm like, why are you doing the same thing with people? Doing yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah, I just... Ed, sorry, I don't even remember the question anymore. <laughs> <I'm just gonna laughs> <push> it. <laughs> it, so it sounds like we're really touching on everything. And George is just how it just started all off. Like, is this really a big picture that we should be looking at rather than a black and white thing? I think, um, I think a good point to touch on there. Um, I don't think that this is some new flame that started. I think we've been fanning the flames for a while and it just happened to blow up. But um, to get away from that, I think that it isn't really a black and white thing, but it's also black people tend to spearhead every movement. We tend to be the ones that are speaking up on things and then we're still left behind. If you look at LGBTQ communities, it was a black trans woman who spearheaded that and yet there are still so many people in the um, LGBTQ or queer community who are still racist towards black people as if they weren't the ones who fought in solidarity with them and I think that's um, a big issue because we tend to spearhead all these movements so although right now I do think it's kind of a black people versus racist, black people versus the cops, things like that, I think that it's bringing about people just being sick of the system in general, sick of the system. Yeah, bringing all people of color and people being oppressed together and um, yeah. I think they're all just under the umbrella of, it started, I guess I wouldn't think started, but it, this one sparked with George Floyd this time around. I think everyone's kind of being like, you know what, I'm pissed about that, but I'm also pissed about this. So let's just, let's dismantle the system that has been set in place to keep us down. So before we finish off, I just read this really cool stat. NWA Fuck the Police saw a 272% increase in streams between May 27th and June 1st with 765,000 downloads or streams. I'm probably 50% of that. <laughs> <laughs> I Same think here. <laughs> um, if you had to pick one track to encompass what's happening and maybe even on Saturday, if you had to pick a track to encompass what's happening on Saturday, at uh, Victoria Park, what tracks uh, would you use? For me, I think there's two different paths you can go. Um, part of me would, um, we've been really broadcasting this as a very peaceful protest and a very, um, we're fighting for it. And I think we are 
degree, but I think at the core, it's want to be recognized for who we are. We want to be recognized as humans. So I think I would pick a song like um, Black is Beautiful by, Beautiful, sorry, by Tota Santos. And I think it's just, it's talking about all these different things about being Black and being, um, being happy with who you are. Because I think I do this a lot. I know I do it a lot. Um, I get tired of being discriminated against, of being having the system made against me and sometimes like especially when I was younger I just wanted to be white and I think it's really hard to remember that it's not our fault it is not our fault that these people are pressing us it's their fault it's not my fault yeah. that I'm born mixed or things like that it, it's not my you don't choose your race that's yeah yeah um for me okay you go continue no keep going Okay, um, I think I would choose To Pimp a Butterfly by Kendrick Lamar because that is that whole al album is about what's going on right now, about like uh, police brutality and like protesting and stuff. Um, specifically from that album, I think I would pick All Right because it's like, we're going to be all right and all of that. Yeah, so definitely that. So let's talk about Saturday and there you have a GoFundMe campaign going on. And uh, sorry, three questions in one, but I'm sure you guys can make it all into one little thing. Um, you have the GoFundMe going on. Uh, you still want to be acknowledged as the official Black Lives Matter in Canada, the fourth, I believe. And then you have Saturday. Um, just to wrap up all that in one nice little present, what's going uh, on? I think we are, I just want to make that clear. Um, we're not yet a part of the Black Lives Matter chapters of Canada. I think we expressed a little interest in that, especially with the traction that was being made. But um, I think recently we've realized how difficult that is. Um, so maybe if we don't spearhead it, we possibly might. Um, but I think we just kind of want one here in London, but um, we are not yet a part of that or affiliated. We've just been kind of speaking with them. And um, to touch on the, sorry, I don't know why I forgot the other two parts of the question. <laughs> The Where GoFundMe and then yeah. the Saturday at the, 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 the protest. If you want to go on that, Jada. Um, so for the GoFundMe, we're, uh, all the, the money that is in use for supplies and such, we're thinking of donating it to other Black Lives Matter um, chapters around Canada, like the Toronto one, all the other ones. Um, and we're going to split that equally. And then with the rest of the money, we might donate it to other charities. Uh, um, more London-based charities, just like things like the Black Women's Congress, um, not to neglect from the Vancouver and Montreal uh, Black Lives Matter chapters, but just to kind of, it would be easier to make a chapter here if we could uplift our Black community and kind of strengthen that. And then, because there are very strong white KKK racist ties and neo-Nazis here, so that tends to be a thing that runs deep here. So if we could get that same kind of traction from the Black community, I think it would be a lot easier to establish one here. And so Saturday, we have to mention the COVID in the room. Um, what special precautions should I take when I go? Um, we are definitely, as the organization, I think we're not, sorry, the few people who have been organizing it. Um, we've tried to incorporate enough things, but I think just bringing your mask, making sure you, you're changing your mask, even if you don't bring multiple, you can always ask us for it. We are going to be providing them. Um, oh, a a lot. Lot. Yeah. yeah, we're not really sure how many people are coming, but um, we've gotten as many as we can possibly. Well, and we uh, people bring their own mask in case we can't provide for everyone, so um, yeah, we definitely want people to bring their own mask, but um, as well as we'll be if you guys could bring your own hand sanitizer, things like that, we will be providing those, but it is on limited supply, and we're not really sure how many people are going to be coming in support on that day, so that really depends, but um. Yeah, just trying to stick with people who are in, who came from your household, who came in your group. Um, don't really mingle with others. Try to stay six feet apart. Um, we're going to enforce those as best as we can. Um, things like that. Um, making sure if you do go to the bathroom, you come and use hand sanitizer um, even after you wash your hands. And when you're, if you do change your mask, things like using hand sanitizer or washing your hands. Um, I think that's very important to put out there. And yeah, and, and I think those Ask properly when you do change them. So, like, throw them out. Don't throw them on the ground. Because then um, we have to pick them up later. Yeah. That's going to be on us. Um, sorry, I forgot my last point. Um, yeah, I think that's... Oh, oh, yeah, very importantly, because a lot of people tend to wear their mask wrong. Your mask has to go over your mouth and your nose. Yeah. Um, 
that is I don't know why that's not common sense but um, <laughs> <laughs> that is that is the thing that he uh. <laughs> and it starts off at three o'clock yeah, yes we have uh, exact times but like we're starting at three um, kind of want to be on the march around four and then you know people can come back they can talk with us if they'd like uh, ground but yeah we want to kind of wrap everything up around six ish it's not like strict times obviously but um mm -hmm. we want to be cleaning up the park around six and everything like that cool and it's uh you have a facebook page what's the website but black lives matter london ontario okay cool yeah. all right you ladies are refreshing to listen to and you're like the future's in really good hands with you too. So thank you so much. And thank you. Uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll see if I can see you guys on Saturday. Okay, great.